History is a blend of light and dark. And what we have stumbled into is, is a story of dark, of darkness and of criminal behavior and of pain. You know, when we walked into the research, we kind of knew four things about him. We knew he was a congregate in Old North. We knew he was married and had a couple kids. Uh, we knew he was a slaveholder, and we knew he'd been murdered off the coast of Suriname in 1743. Uh, th that's all the, the information we really had, and he was a chocolate chocolatier. And then the story became bigger and bigger as we began looking through the documents. We are not removing his story. His name has come off the outside of the building. His story has moved inside the building. Today, Old North stands as an icon of American uh, revolutionary spirit, um, an icon of liberty and freedom. It's the site of where the lanterns were held on the night of April 18th, 1775. It's part of a plan um, devised by Paul Revere to warn the colonists of the British regulars marching to Lexington and Concord. What we've learned is that Old North was far more than a house of worship, and we knew that it was a social opportunity for a lot of people to come together every week. Um, it was a way for people to meet business partners and things like that. But what we didn't know was how entangled the congregants were with the institution of slavery. Captain Jackson was a slave owner. He was one of the congregants here. He owned a pew. We thought we had found out everything there was. We thought he was a pretty, you know, average person, average white male in 18th century Boston. And one of the things we did know from the initial research was that in 1743, uh, early June 1743, off the coast of Suriname, he'd been murdered uh, in a mutiny. He was most active selling chocolate in about 1740, uh, early 1740s. And in that time period, there was, with, if you look at the entire British Empire, there was very little cacao. So the, the logical question is, well, where was he getting the chocolate from? And it's actually the mutiny that answered that question. Being murdered off the coast of Suriname, this Dutch colony on the northern coast of South America, and, and there's this extensive connection between between uh, New England and Suriname, uh, a robust trade despite being technically illegal. In one of his business accounts, we, we found the plantations in which he was buying these tropical commodities, sugar, molasses, cacao, um, to send back to New England. One of those, the most prominent of those plantations was a plantation called Fairfield Plantation. And it was founded by a Highland Scot in the early, uh, in the 1670s actually, by the name of Henry McIntosh. Henry McIntosh later moved to Bristol, Massachusetts, what's now Bristol, Rhode Island. He had a daughter uh, named Elizabeth, who had two granddaughters named Elizabeth and Mary. Elizabeth McIntosh later married a man named Isaac Royal Jr. He's the largest slaveholder in Massachusetts, um, and he also just happens to own this huge plantation in Suriname through his marriage to Elizabeth McIntosh. That's doing business with Edward Tottle, who is the main merchant, you know, the, the, the agent for merchants between New England and, and, and Suriname. So we have a, a snapshot shortly before the mutiny of Fairfield Plantation, uh, and, it, and there are 1,800 cacao trees on the plantation, over, uh, over 90 enslaved people uh, working the plantation. Uh, that's also growing coffee and, and sugar as well. And this is the source of cacao. We found the, the records of the trial and the mutiny, and from there, there's lots and lots of names that start showing up. Uh, other crew members of the ship who were not murdered, the names of the mutineers, uh, the names of the agent, in, the name of the agent in Suriname who was helping facilitate this trade and who took it upon himself to sort all of this out after the mutiny, who gets property, who filed the insurance claim, things like that. This is the, the piece that, that kind of brought all of this research home. It's, the listing of the 15 enslaved people that were on board the ship at the time of the mutiny, including 13 children. What we came to realize was the nature in which those enslaved people are listed, they're not listed as part of the cargo, they're listed as part of the ship, uh, strongly suggests that this voyage um, of the Rising Sun, which had left Barbados to Suriname, um, captained by Newark Jackson, uh, was actually a slave trading voyage. Fairly robust, um, not an uncommon phenomenon in the 18th century, um, but it took place, you know, two men of Old North congregants. But it goes a little bit deeper uh, as we continue digging. Isaac Royal Jr. was a congregant at Old North. Edward Toddle, while he lived in Boston, was a congregant at Old North, and good friends. In fact, the Dutch records actually refer to Edward Toddle as the, quote, good friend uh, of George Ledane. 
the leader of, the, of this kind of expedition. What was really shocking is the way that all of these men uh, have these connections to Old North. So this is Pew 13 and it belonged to Newark Jackson. What's so interesting is that he is right here in Pew 13 and if you just step just a couple of pews over here to Pew 7, um, this is the pew that belonged to George Ladane who was murdered on board the ship with him. So when we think about Old North serving as a social nexus for the smuggling ring and slave trading, um, the, all these activities, the cacao trading, all that, um, you can just see how close these men were together in, uh, in the actual physical space of the church. Edward Tottle gave money to build the steeple, uh, gave money for the bells. Uh, Isaac Royal also donated money uh, uh, to the church. Uh, but then Gedney Clark, who the kind of uh, ringleader, the godfather of the smuggling ring uh, that, that we found, um, he gave 100 pounds sterling for the, the Peel of Bells. Uh, he's the largest single don uh, donor uh, for the bells in the church. Ultimately, you know, that, that wealth comes from, uh, from slavery, whether slave trading or the labor of enslaved people growing tropical commodities. The death of one man opened a whole world of, of smuggling, of slave trading, uh, and has forced us to kind of reinterpret uh, the, this site. So we're in a space that used to be called Captain Jackson's Historic Chocolate Shop. Uh, it is no longer called Captain Jackson's Historic Chocolate Shop. It is now the Historic Chocolate Program at Old North. And what we had decided to do was that Jackson's name would be removed from any sort of positive connotation, but that Jackson's story would be told in accurately on our campus. This sign used to be outside. And this sign will be coming inside as an exhibit. We're going to display it as an artifact, as an exhibit piece inside. So we will inform our guests and visitors why this space is no longer called Captain Jackson's, because we're owning this. Um, this is the truth. We realize that the story of Old North and its entanglement of, of a sort with slavery is far more than just what happened with Captain Newark Jackson. He was one of many, many people. You know, Boston is the cradle of liberty. You know, this is this is the church, the one if by land, two if by sea, the Paul Revere's Ride Church. This is it's known for its celebration of American liberty, of uh, you know, uh, saving us from British tyranny. Um, and yet, uh, the, its 18th century history before the Revolution tells a very different story, uh, one of unfreedom rather than freedom, one of, uh, of slavery. 